the fact that we can find nothing that's reliably helpful is, you know, is troublesome. It's, 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 it's challenging. But it's an opportunity and it shows that there's a, there, there's, 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 a, there's a syndrome here which is, you can describe and which is the same all over the world and there must be a treatment for it. So I, I see the lack of a treatment as, I guess, an opportunity. But I, I certainly understand that at the moment for an individual with visual snow, it's very frustrating. As a surgeon uh, who grew up in traditional medicine, I'm a strong believer in traditional medicine, uh, as, as we're taught. However, I think that, that alternative medicine has a huge role to play in our healthcare because in the end, our bodies are very complex and we don't have the answers to everything. As much as we like to believe it, we don't have the answers to everything. So one should never rule out alternative therapies. And I think that in many, in, in many of my patients, things like meditation, uh, mindfulness, uh, exercises, yoga, have really helped patients calm things down and focus on their condition and then defocus on their condition and, and has helped a lot of my patients with, uh, with visual snow. The other things that have really helped is exercise, a good diet. I find that a lot of my patients have, uh, have decreased their, um, or some patients have decreased their sugar intake, have decreased their meat intake and become purely vegetarian, have, uh, you know, um, done all these sort of, have sort of embraced an anti-immunogenic uh, diet and that has helped them somewhat. The other thing is, you know, uh, cannabis has also been used by a lot of my patients, uh, by three patients, uh, and, and that's a lot because the, the number of, of people with visual soul is not, very, is, is, is not very high. But they've used cannabis, and even today I was speaking to a lot of patients today at the conference who have, two of them have used cannabis to some really good results. And so, you know, and I think the whole point of that is things that really calm you down, that, that decrease that hyperactivity, I think may have an improvement in things. So my view on anecdotal evidence in medicine and my view on alternative therapies is that, you know what, um, as long as it's not doing any harm and it's sensible, why not use it? And as long as you don't deny or you don't reject traditional medicine, why not use it? What is the harm? I think that CBD has a really strong role. It works in many different areas. I mean, it's been known to help with pain, uh, with chronic pain. Uh, it's been even known to help with depression and certain mood states. And so, you know, if it's already been established, it's been approved by many of the medical boards, both in Canada and the U.S. for uh, for use. I mean, that's where the term medical marijuana came in. So, I mean, why why would it not work um, in in a condition like visual snow that affects so much of the brain and the visual cortex and the whole vision pathways and we don't know a lot about, right? So I really do think that CBD has a role. There are patients where it's worked for them and so why not try it? With regards to other therapies for visual snow, I think there are some behavioral changes one can do and I think wearing glasses with certain tints uh, can, can actually help um, you know, help decrease visual snow symptoms. There are numerous uh, alternative treatments that have been trialled, uh, ranging from uh, cannabis to meditation to all sorts of things. Um, all of the reports are anecdotal, and I find it difficult to accept a treatment as a treatment unless it's been properly trialled. So I, I don't consider any of those anecdotal reports to actually constitute a useful therapy. And until such time as they are trialled, um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't use them. In terms of uh, personal experience with anecdotal reports, um, I've had several patients that uh, have uh, felt that cannabis helped them. Uh, but my feeling at the time was that it helped reduce their anxiety levels, uh, partly on the basis that they felt they were doing something and partly on the pharmacological basis that uh, cannabis uh, works. I don't think that it necessarily changes uh, the underlying physiological abnormality in the majority of patients. It may well work, work in a few patients, um, but I've had other patients try things that are significantly dangerous as well, and I think, uh, um, I think whatever you try should be uh, uh, in conjunction with your uh, authorised professional as they say. How does cannabis help? Um, does it help? Uh, it's, it's hard to know. I think that uh, in some patients it may well help with the symptoms, uh, but I think more likely it's helping with the anxiety levels uh, than anything else. But I don't, we don't know because we can't measure it. 
We can't measure the underlying abnormality and until we can, we won't know what really works. Yoga was tremendously valuable for me in terms of its ability to help me regulate my sympathetic nervous system. So yoga essentially um, activates your sympathetic nervous system, which is the body's natural fight or flight response, uh, by using physical exertion and in motion. So we're, we're going through the movements, we're getting our body fired up. But while we're doing that, we're intentionally trying to calm it back down at the same time by using focus awareness and essentially uh, mindfulness practices in general. So this combination essentially uh, elevates your sympathetic nervous system and then calms it back down and teaches you how to keep this in balance so that uh, things don't kind of spiral out of control from stressing about your symptoms. Meditation was even more helpful to me than yoga, though I think it required a combination of all these things in order to, uh, to get to where I am today. But meditation helps in the same way that yoga does in that it teaches you to learn how to to deal with um, either painful or pleasurable thoughts, emotions, or physical sensations, to learn how to be uh, calm in the face of them. And so with meditation, you're essentially using focused awareness of breath, uh, essentially having this object of meditation that you're concentrating on uh, while these things are going on around you. You have thoughts go through your head, you have certain emotions that happen, you feel certain bodily sensations, but you're just attempting to maintain calm, just equanimity in the face of these painful or pleasurable thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations. And if you do this long enough and you practice this using the right techniques, you can essentially learn how to just maintain this calm all day long. So while my symptoms would originally cause me stress, like I would, I would think about the symptom or I'd, I'd experience the symptom and I'd start to worry about it, uh, nowadays uh, it's just a normal part of life. I've just habituated it to it. And these mindfulness practices, I do honestly believe, have helped to rewire that part of my brain that associated the negative response with the symptoms so that that is now broken. And I essentially don't have uh, a negative response to the symptoms anymore. It's, it's not perfect, but uh, in, in comparison to how I was at one point in time, like this is a night and day difference. A negative response, by that I just mean that uh, you have a, a negative thought or a negative emotional reaction to the experience of your symptoms. So your symptoms are here and it causes this uh, response and that response is negative. And that response essentially does a couple bad things. It, um, number one, it, it gets you to focus more on the symptoms, which I don't know, I don't think that's helpful because if your brain is constantly focusing on these symptoms, uh, that's, you're just not moving on with your life. The other thing it's doing in, in many cases is aggravating your symptoms as well. So I noticed that the more stressed out I become, the, uh, the more noticeable my symptoms become. The tinnitus grows louder, the visual snow becomes louder. I assume it's just a normal part of um, you know, the, the way the brain operates. But if I can keep my uh, stress levels low, then I don't experience the symptoms as much. And if uh, my stress levels are high, I experience the symptoms more. The trick is you don't want that to create a feedback loop that's growing out of control with these negative emotions in connection to the, uh, the, the sensations, what you're experiencing, the symptoms. And this has helped tremendously in other areas of my life as well. So I do a lot of public speaking. Uh, it's very interesting, but prior to my first meditation retreat, uh, when I was getting ready to give a, a presentation, you know, my hands would start sweating, my heart rate would accelerate, the normal reaction people have when you're giving a presentation. However, after uh, my first 10 day uh, Vipassana meditation course, um, I went up and gave a presentation. I was just calm as could be. I'm like, this is really interesting. And that has essentially persisted uh, for years afterwards. Uh, when I get up now and I give a presentation, I'm significantly calmer. I'm just, I'm, I'm in good shape.